Welcome to Backyard Philosophy, a podcast where a couple friends grab some cold ones, sit around the fire, and talk about science, philosophy, and history. Crack one open, sit back, and get a good laugh as we discuss everything from automation to why the meaning of life is 42. There is a saying. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And speaking of pigs, the cosmetic industry. Boy, is it an ugly one. It might make people feel beautiful, but behind the scenes, it's as ugly as a pig. But before we get into that, Nick, how are you doing? And what are you drinking? I am doing much better than I'm inside. It's a rainy season here in the Pacific Northwest, so I'm solely drinking hot chocolate. No, no booze, just getting warmed up. What about you? I'm warming up in a different way with some Buffalo Trace, and uh, it's still uh, 75 and sunny here in Texas. It's got to be the uh, the fastest we mentioned Texas. Oh, I'm quick on the draw, just like them Rangers. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but another way that, but getting back to the point of the makeup industry, makeup and cosmetics from perfume to oils to creams to dyes have been in human history since civilization started, I mean, the earliest I found was about 10,000 BC when the Egyptians were using creams and oils to help exfoliate their skin, to make themselves gleaming, to clean themselves. And I was wondering if you have anything older than that, Nick, or that was the, that was the earliest I could find. Um, there's a, a, I guess, I don't know if the right word is perfumer, but there is a woman in Mesopotamia in 1200 bc who made perfumes well i'm happy this is not the price of right because you would have beat me but man maybe uh everything's older than we think especially with the mesopotamian area and we just lost it throughout time and we're slowly collecting it yeah and uh, that's yeah and uh well that's also india was also a notable mention of uh one of the older oldest uh places as well it's it's uh it's been around for a while I think it's one of those things that we've always had. It, it's some something to make everyone different. Oh, yes. Just to stand out, to feel high society, to traditions. I mean, kind of running through it, like you said, you have the Mesopotamians with their introduction, the introduction of perfume. 10,000 BC, where you have the Egyptians using oils and creams. 3,000 BC, the Chinese were starting to stain their fingernails, so I guess the first sort of nail polish. 1500 BC, Chinese and Japanese and Koreans were powdering their face with rice powder to whiten their faces. 100 AD, people were using flour and butter on their pimples, along with finger polish, mud baths, and ma- and men dyeing their hair blonde. Well, one, the Romans, what did they ever do for us? Seems like they've done a lot for us, Nick. They made roads. Peace? peace? Who <laughs> wants peace? <laughs> Not too far after that, in 300 AD, the... Tradition of henna in India, a skin decoration, became common. And around 1200-ish, uh, perfumes were first imported to Europe from the Middle East through the Silk Road. And, I mean, from the beginning, makeup has been a high commodity. And it's not changed very much in the modern world. It is a multi-billion dollar industry every single year. I mean, currently it's about five hundred billion dollars, somewhere around that mark. Not sure if you had a different number there, Nick. Uh, so, beauty products, world trade, fifty-six point seven billion. Fifty-six. Yeah, fifty-six point seven billion. All right. So your number might be right. I want to make this as a caveat before we continue with the podcast. When researching this, I don't know if you had the same problem, Nick, but the word choice and the range of when you type in makeup or cosmetics heavily changes yes so So, like some of that doesn't include like lotion some does include lotion some doesn't include perfume some yeah it's a um so this just this is a lipstick eyeshadow mascara skincare product so that includes like just your normal hand lotion which is kind i I don't i wasn't really gonna really lump that in with uh, what we're talking about unless you were this also includes sunscreen, so... I was going to lump it in a little bit because uh, cosmetics, uh, according to the United States, can be both a cosmetic and a drug. So, for example, shampoo 
is technically a cosmetic, but if it's like anti-dandruff, it's technically a drug and a cosmetic. So they have different regulations. So I was going to touch on that. But when researching this, uh, the quote unquote beauty market has such a, it's, it's, there's no one lane. It is moving left and right and there's no standard for it. So I saw $500 billion, but that might include the sunscreen, the lotions and all that. The soul mascara foundation lipstick. I probably, your number is probably right, Nick, with the 50 odd billion, 50 odd billion dollars. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's high, I guess is the main point. <laughs> And the complication of how what goes into them has increased throughout the ages. I mean, back when our ancestors were using makeup, they weren't exactly the healthiest, using mercury and urine and all that fun stuff, but we haven't really changed that much using other types of chemicals that are uh, dangerous, bad, and kind of evil for uh, the environment. Uh, one that I'm kind of passionate about, Nick, which I don't think you would have researched because I don't think most people know about this, but... Glitter, out of chance, do you know a little bit about glitter? Uh, I plead the fifth. <laughs> Smart man. So glitter, that shiny little specks that is used in a lot of cosmetics for face makeup, you know, hand makeup, doing decorations, signs. It's destroying our planet. Glitter is a microplastic, and when it gets washed on the drain or falls throughout the day of wearing it, it ends up in the environment and the water. It's quite detrimental. People are even calling for a global ban on it. Teresa Farley at Massey University in New Zealand is one of them. And it's the same with ma uh, microbeads. So microplastic and microbeads, they're pretty much the same thing, just different shapes. These plastic minuscule beads that are found in many face washes and toothpaste, did not know I was putting plastic in my mouth when brushing my teeth, they don't disintegrate. Scientists estimate more than 8 trillion microbeads enter U.S. waters daily. With that being said, in 2015, the U.S. Congress implemented the law number 114-114, the Microbead Free Waters Act, which is prohibited from adding microbeads to rinse off cosmetics, but don't know how much has been enforced, and I can guarantee you there are certain countries who are definitely not following that rule and regulation. Well, and it's... It's interesting. So, like, so cars, when they get imported, they a lot, pretty much every country in the world is beholden to like a, what the United States manufactures because we're such a huge market. But we're only 8.4% of uh, the import market for um, what's it called uh, cosmetics. cosmetics. Yeah. So, we're not the, the biggest market. We're not a small market. You know, we're behind. Uh, China and Hong Kong and looks like we're we're third but so it's not it does to me it doesn't seem like one there's so much of it how do you regulate it but also we're not the where most of this is going so it's not being tailored to our markets oh I was surprised on the amount of imports going to Asian countries and honestly some of the regulations are disgusting I uh I almost feel like I don't have to bring it up, but China, damn it, China. China is the only country that still requires cosmetics to be tested on animals, and they have the second largest cosmetic economy. Luckily, in 2000, I'm uh, sorry, in January 2021, China lifted some of its mandatory animal testing on imported cosmetics, but from what I can tell, China has animal testing on imported cosmetics that are still not self-produced makeup. So it seems like a lot of cosmetics are still being uh, tested on animals. And to back up what Nick was saying, in 2019, the Asian Pacific region made up 41% of the global cosmetic market. That's, uh, what what's that? Maybe a, an eighth of the region of landmass on the entire planet and makes up nearly half the global cosmetic market? Yeah, so I... China is only 15.4% of the importers, but Hong Kong alone, in addition to the rest of China, so Hong Kong is 8.64 and the rest of China is 15, followed by Singapore and South Korea. It's a, it's a big market. The old, so above third, uh, it's US, we said is 8.4. Germany is 4.7, UK 4.2, and France 3.4. Which is crazy because I guess France would have a low import. They're the highest exporter 
France is the largest exporter of beauty products. To me, in that numbers and countries you list off, Germany was the most surprising to me on that list. I figured Germans don't like importing. That might just be a stereotype I have in my head. I always figured German engineering, German making. I I actually don't know what the population of Germany is, but didn't think that it would be that as potential where they're second behind the United States. Well, granted, it would be third in the world, but yeah, but still, Germany, that threw me off guard. Yeah, that's, I mean, the, to be fair, this is an industry I knew nothing about. So this is all catching me off guard, but uh, not what I would thought either. And I was also surprised. Nick, you're you're telling me you're not putting on a dress and lipstick and wig every weekend. You know, uh, I... Are you not a lumberjack and okay? And like to sleep all night and work all day? I don't get the reference, but no. <laughs> but... Mighty Python, the lumberjack song? No, it t- no, it took me a minute. I was thinking completely something else. Um, but no, I, I was really surprised by the exports and imp- imports and exports. Mostly, I guess it kind of makes sense, but I was surprised that France was the mo- the ma- like seventeen point seven percent of beauty products exports. And for being, I don't know, I've never really seen any time we've done any of these podcasts. It's basically been. For exporters, it's either like the U.S. or China. Uh, Agreed. And out of curiosity, Nick, for exports, is exports in France or companies in France exporting? I'm Because I saw a lot of countries, a lot of companies using third world labor to reduce their makeups, which is got kind of dark going down that rabbit hole. And uh, saw couple of France companies, and I wasn't sure if the export was through their country or export outside the country through companies in their country. Uh, I don't know if they, how they, uh, if it had to be just like based in France or just a French company, because that could be what's going on here. The only reason I mention this is, like I said, with animal testing in China, uh, the most popular cosmetic brands of 2020 and 2021, NARS, Laurel, Chanel, the list goes on. God, I already feel the assassins coming for me. We're all caught red-handed and still do animal testing. And I was just wondering if maybe France had certain laws where they're allowed to do certain animal testing or simply they just had it in a different country so the laws didn't exactly apply. I do not know, but I'm going to do a quick Google search and get back to you. Well, just to stick on with uh, animal testing a little bit, because that, to me, is the most disgusting thing, is how is animal testing still a thing? I, Nick, I'll be honest. When in elementary school, I heard about it. Like, people, like, I saw the posters of people putting lipstick on chimpanzees or testing uh, cosmetic creams on pigs, but I thought that was a dying out, no longer thing. I thought that was a thing of the past. I thought we, you know... With all our modern technology, we would have moved away from that. But some of the biggest companies are still doing that, which it, it makes no sense to me. And again, I'm going to say cosmetics throughout this entire episode of not just lipstick, mascara, foundation. I'm putting cosmetics as a whole of sunscreen, lotions, uh, acne cream, et cetera, et cetera. Cosmetics and beauty products were so interchangeable throughout researching this that i'm just lumping them all together with cosmetics just wanted to point that out so everyone's on the same page copy just a quick update uh france has so much export dollars because pretty much every big name in this industry is out of france so you have uh chanel estee lauder i don't know how to say any of these this is ridiculous christian dior this um tu para un français? Yeah, I, I took Spanish, okay. Do you Espanol? Un poco. But yeah, so I guess, I mean, my question is, I understand with the animal testing, because how else do you make sure things are safe for, for skin? Like you need... I don't know, maybe we're, s- since we're growing organs and, and, and bats. Why don't we just test it on one of the organs that we grow? But I feel like it needs to be exposed to like a... Not nervous system. Nature, sunlight. Oh, what's this part of your immune, immune system? system? Yeah. 
Boy, that hot chocolate's really hitting you hard. You should lay off the bottle. It's uh, it's spicy. Did you put a little cinnamon in there? Yeah, I got one of those big swirly cinnamon stick things. Oh, now I'm wondering horchata. No, I'm I'm going to pass on the horchata. But yeah, I mean, I feel like the amines like I feel like you're not testing to see what it's going to do on skin. You're testing to see how it's going to interact with an immune system. I think it's just it's more how toxic it is and how it it works on top of the, your your organ, which is your skin. I don't think they're really caring about your immune system. I don't really think most cosmetic companies are really caring if they give you cancer or carcinogenic diseases because a lot of them have carcinogenic and messed up materials inside those makeups. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. I just, uh, I don't know. Are we there, like, technology-wise to where these companies could print, like, not like not just like a layer like all the layers of skin and then like keep it alive and, and study it i just i'm just not uh i don't really look into this so you're gonna have to enlighten me uh we can't well, i mean we can grow synthetic organs we're still in the testing phase but i'm also thinking there's other options like uh john does and jane does cadavers uh, pro- uh animal parts that we can't use for food production like in the mass production of food, there's definitely waste. Why not use some of those? Like, um, Well, I think it needs to be alive to elicit a response, right? No, because you can pour salt on dead frogs and they'll dance around. I, I, I'm not quite sure. I'll be honest. I actually don't know what they're looking for when they're doing testing on animals. Are they looking for, will this cause skin reaction? Or are they looking, will, uh, the, is this product effective on covering your red marks on your face i'm not quite actually sure what they're looking for i mean i like we talked about a lot of these are also regulated as drugs i imagine it's some it's they're looking for anything that's going to hurt you well they're not exactly naming them as drugs some of them are technically drugs and so that'd be like your sunscreens and stuff your sunscreens, your anti-dandruff, your acne cream, but other stuff, they don't have to list their ingredients. Like uh, perfume in general are covered underneath the Fair Packaging and Label Act in 1973 United States. So cosmetics, they can label all ingredients in like perfume, cologne, simply as fragrance. They don't have to tell you their actual ingredients. And that was kind of common for a lot of cosmetic stuff. They don't have to tell you what's in it because it's not being eaten it's not being put inside your body and it's not said to do any medical wonders on your body such as like remove acne or remove dandruff or stuff like that so they don't have to disclose that information yeah and i i I guess it's uh i don't know i i don't think anyone goes to and like looks at a lotion but i think it's one of those things where it's like devised on it puts its lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again man there there's our opener but uh, (laughs) (laughs) yeah i feel like it's one of those things where that's why you buy like the brand name like i don't really know of anyone who buys like off-brand like lotions now makeup's probably a different thing because there's i've walked down that the aisle with all the man this is we i'm the wrong person to talk about this but with all the uh, like <laughs> lipstick and whatever, and there, there's so many different kinds. Yeah, I'm sure you have some off brands in there. Well, I guess that's part of the problem. Like it's like we talked about with the export and how such comes from all over the world, and it'd be you know might be a company based out of somewhere, but doing work in a third world. So yeah, I get what you're saying. But there's uh, so many other things in our world that we we regularly put on our skin. I guess not regularly, but we all like. I don't know how to say this without sounding like I snort gasoline, but we've all, you know, inhaled like the gas and diesel fumes and all that stuff that Sharpies. we know is is toxic. Do you say Arby's? Sharpies. Oh, Sharpies. <laughs> Arby's. We have the fumes. Uh, no, well, to point out that you're generic, I want to make point that is the companies the most popular in 2020 and 2021 all used animal testing. I, if they're making that ethical choice, I'm assuming that they're going to try to nickel and dime everywhere they can. I'm not, I don't think there's much of a difference between 
name brand and off brand. I don't think about potency. I think it's it's kind of like uh, almost like fashion where it's do you have the uh, Gucci bag or don't you? And same with makeup. Are you using this brand? Or are you not? Are, I, I imagine there's a lot of brand loyalty and I imagine there's a lot of marketing like, oh, this is what this superstar uses. So I should use that. Yeah. Um, since I'm married, I can speak a little bit more on this. It's pretty much whatever one. E- it's a uh, I don't know. My wife just uses the one that works best for her and it's different for all of her friends. So it's really just you try them all and then you find one you like and you stick with it. I don't really know if it's that much driven by uh Oh, I imagine I mean, influencers, influencers yeah, on social media. are going to have a little bit, but I I don't know. I, well, I imagine like young like a young girl is seeing her favorite, I don't know, actress, social media star, or whatever, use some certain type of makeup that's going to leave an impression. They're going to start using that brand and they're going to stick with that brand because that's the brand they know. I mean, how often do people venture out from and try new products that they're not familiar with? Especially when it comes to, I would say, something as uh, obvious as makeup. Like quite literally painting your face. It's kind of obvious. So you don't really want to mess that up. As you can tell, ladies and gentlemen, me and Nick are super familiar with uh, makeup and <laughs> all the cosmetics that come along with it. Yes um yeah it's uh yeah we really should have had a a girl on for this one could have walked us through this nick i now have a new thing we should do we should all me and you should go to a beauty salon get our makeup done i would i i i will gladly put on makeup to see you wear makeup hard no that's oh man i will bribe you with beer and fishing i can do that for free well i guess i have to pay for the beer but ammo Ammo's kind of expensive. That's, uh, I must, I have enough to last. So I do have, so I just have a list of alternatives to animal testing, um, which is, like you said, cell cultures growing cells, uh, using human tissues, whether it be, um, cadavers or volunteers. So, so poor college students who can't afford. Yes, exactly. And then uh, computer models and pretty much it. But, uh, I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot of starving college students. There's a lot of starving people in the world who would gladly do that too, especially with the makeup factories being made down the block from them. And just to uh, quickly address, because I have in my notes, um, about the makeup industry not having to disclose their ingredients in the United States, there's a bill called the no PFAs in Cosmetics Act. Boy, we're starting to sound like the British with our naming system, which would remove PFAs in makeup. And for reference, they are toxic and have been leaned to know to cancer. And for reference, uh, a third party tested 231 products found in the United States and Canada and found that 52% of the products of the 230 they tested had PFAs in it. So... Just because we pass the bills doesn't mean it gets passed. And I imagine it's the same with animal testing or different types of testing. Just because we say stop it doesn't mean it's actually going to stop. So what uh, what are PFAs? It's like a plastic, if I remember correctly. Okay. PFAs. Why, yeah, long-lasting it, chemicals, which breaks down very slowly. And they are persistent in the environment. So it's kind of like uh, we talked about in... I can't even remember what episode it was. We talked about where mercury and other and DEET would build up in animals, and another animal would eat it, and then it'd accrue more of it, and then just stay with you. So PFAs, which are is an acronym for because what episode would it be without me mentioning Texas and me messing up words, is perfilacryl and polyfluoracryl substances. Boy, I need to freshen up my Latin badly. I uh, saw that and was just not going to address <laughs> what it was. After... <laughs> <laughs> Nick sees pool two inches deep, goes, now nah, pass. Mike's like, hold my beer. That's not the only negative in a lot of cosmetics. There's actually a lot of nasty bacteria and animal waste, especially when you start getting to counterfeits. It's a uh, it's is a disgusting business. It for something to make people feel pretty and confident. It's quite ugly, Nick. It's uh, and that's not just a play on words. Well, it is, but a little background on PFAs. They were originally invented 
for uh, non-stick and waterproof coatings. Because, oh yes, spraying tent sealer on my face is exactly what I want to do. Oh, and they're in um, aqueous film forming foam, which is a, a type of foam used to fight fires that makes basically makes your if you have a little bit of water it, it'll make your water last longer kind of thing um not a great explanation of it but that's currently in like a big lawsuit right now don't know if it's because of pfas but i just i just saw that well, look at that the makeup world's invading your world nick but i mentioned uh counterfeits i don't know if you did any research on that but i saw some interesting kind of creepy things with uh counterfeit cosmetics before I get into it, do you have anything on counterfeits? I did not look at counterfeits at all. So it's a uh, one multi-million, if not billion-dollar industry. I mean, everyone forges fakes, want to save a buck here and there. It's money's money. It's it's always going to have fake foundries and stuff like that. But what I thought was really interesting in July 2020, in one of the highest peaks of COVID lockdowns in the United States, the Los Angeles Police Department raided the fashion district. I'll be honest, did not know fashion districts were a thing. And they seized $700,000 of counterfeit cosmetics. And like I said, that some cosmetics have traces of bacteria, uh, bacteria and animal waste because of, you know, processing, not exactly ethics, not exactly the best manufacturing methods. Counterfeit cosmetics tend to have even higher levels of those. And not to mention, using fake and harmful chemicals that they don't have to disclose because the labels don't need it. In their products. So you might be thinking, oh, I'm using uh, NARS uh, eyeliner, but actually you're using a fake NARS and you're rubbing chlorine next to your eyes. So like, uh, I guess I'm confused. So they basically are selling. They so cut it's the corners same, by using other kind of Is it the same label or like, is it like one of those yeah, like, janky, like one letter's been changed things? Both. Both. They both do the, uh, for lack of better terms, dollar store method, where it's not Cheerios, it's HOs. Yeah. It's it's it, they do they're doing that, and they're also just doing complete counterfeits of same label, same marketing, uh, same colors, same everything, just to trick people. Gotcha. And so then they get into like mainstream markets, and then you might think you're buying the name brand, but it's actually a knockoff. With fuck oh yeah if you go to yeah and it might you know you might be going to an artsy district you know they, they, they stock it up with that oh i'm saving a deal because i'm buying in bulk in fact you're buying in bulk the wrong chemicals that's why it's so cheap next thing you know you're to, you're putting dangerous chemicals on your face and skin and the reason i mentioned this is well actually now it's gonna turn into a jab and not me to turn into a jab uh it's, a, it's a happening with men's products too you're like wait a minute mike i don't wear cosmetics well you actually might not nick because you don't shave uh shaving cream razors i mean companies are now doing a heavy push towards men's cosmetics and when there's a lot of money a lot of fakes follow shaving creams aftershave all have been found to have counterfeits well you're right i don't shave so this is hurtful as well as informative no, I mean, I believe it. That's one of those things you don't think twice about. I'll be honest. I When I buy something at a store, I usually tend to think, oh, it's the actual name brand. I actually don't check to see if it's a counterfeit. So how, if it's how off, do you know? It's a good question. I have no <laughs> idea. I thought you were about to tell me. <laughs> nope. And the reason why I'm a little bit more concerned with this is like I said, makeups are makeup companies, cosmetic companies are doing a huge push towards the male demographic. It has been increasing over the years dramatically. And they suspect for men's personal care, it's supposed to hit 166 billion by 2020. Could not find any factuals to hit that, but let's say it's not completely there. Let's just say it's a hundred billion dollars worldwide of men wearing makeup of or personal care or stuff like that. That's a lot of money. I mean, um, Shrick and Wilskin, a, a kind of popular razor brand, brought Harry's, like uh, the the shaving company, for $1.37 billion. Now, like I said, when there's money, the fakes and the leeches will follow. So it might 
be more negatively effective towards us personally, Nick. I mean, we don't have, I don't think I've ever worn makeup or anything like that. Uh, well, maybe, I, I don't know, acne cream and toothpaste apparently falls underneath the cosmetic things. But more of our, more of men-based cosmetics is coming and the counterfeits will soon follow, which is really scary. And I have no idea, to be honest, how to tell a counterfeit makeup product. Well, while we're on the subject of shaving, um, I want to say how ridiculous uh, Gillette is with first they're, you know, trying to be green woke agenda and all that stuff. And then every time you buy a razor, you have to buy a new fucking thing to put it on because they keep changing their razors so that your razors are out of date by the time you need new razors. So you just have to keep re like buying all this other plastic that you don't need that they kept it the same. <laughs> so you have 35 different handles and it just, they just, none of them click together. Yes. Yeah. It's okay. That's why I definitely switched brands out of, uh, out of high school and I am now like my brands quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah, my biggest pet peeve, I, <laughs> so it's, we're not getting sponsored no. by them. Well, it's, they, they always <laughs> put all this shit about how great they are for the environment. It's like, you know, it'd be great for the environment if I didn't have to buy 15 different kinds of razors just so i could shave that would be great for the environment gillette yeah yeah and i don't know i didn't do much research on this but are you familiar with uh like nair products nick uh yeah yeah so <laughs> body removal i imagine i had a uh, no, <laughs> I, should... I lost a bet so yeah oh okay uh well i had to do it a lot for like boxing being kind of clean shaven and stubble and stuff like that and it, it, it gets annoying shaving your chest with a razor just there's easier yeah, I, uh, I had one really clean nipple <laughs> <laughs> i feel like uh there's a story behind that but uh i imagine like it says on the label don't leave it on for your skin more than 10 minutes or may cause burns i feel like there should be maybe more investigation to that or a little bit more knowledge if it might chemically burn me i feel like chemical burns are nasty i feel like there should be more warning labels or information on the bottle about that this is also a really dumb question is nair just a men's product or is it also a female i'm pretty product? sure it's primarily a female's project my dude the more you know yeah you're uh <laughs> clearly you don't know a lot of fighters nope i just know a lot of women apparently <laughs> <laughs> You don't have a lot of Sasquatches up there in the north. You'd be surprised. I haven't found them yet. I feel like there's a French joke there somewhere, but uh, it's escaping me. I I have no idea what French joke you're trying to make. Oh, you know, girls not shaving their armpits, stuff like oh, that. I feel like that's more a Portland thing now than a French thing. Ah, touche, touche, touche. Uh, <sighs> They're both foreign, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> uh but I wanna I, I wanna run back something. Uh, we mentioned influencers, and I couldn't find any any social media research on how that has changed the cosmetic industry. And I imagine it has to do something. I mean, the most recent cosmetic industry social media thing I could find was in 2015, and even then it was not the best scientific article. And that was in 2015. The social media world has changed so much from then. And I imagine, I mean, kids are wearing makeup, to me, almost seems like younger and younger. I mean, I saw multiple articles saying that they have makeup for children that's not harmful, but I couldn't find any scientific evidence to support it. And straight off the bat, I disagree with them. I don't... All right, so two things. All right, let's just stick with the social media thing. I could not find so uh, the impact of social media on the cosmetic market. Because I remember the commercials, like, back in the day, Nick, where they had, like, the, I don't know, the perfume commercial with a spray where it's, like, two beautiful people on a boat and a beach, which made no absolute sense, and it just transformed into a perfume bottle. Or the Old Spice commercials of a guy on a horse, you know, just transforming. I I don't know how that impl that plays on a person's psychology, both young and old. Yeah, I mean that's a good. I don't. I don't know if we really do. I mean, I guess we do, right? Well, I mean, I think you probably just lump it in with general like social media, just to 
a consequence of the general social media being bad for like development and stuff is what I would guess. Social media bad. I don't know. I mean, I I feel like that maybe that specifically hasn't been studied, but like that's really just one part of I think that's a whole separate thing. I mean, I think well, I feel like I think uh I mean I think cosmetics is just like most other things we talk about. Uh it's a tool. You know, you can use it right or wrong. You can use it the right way for the wrong reasons, the wrong way for the right reasons. And uh, I don't, I think it's in used in certain capacities as like a, a crutch. It's probably not good, but also if it's, you know, improved self-esteem, it shouldn't be, it's like, you know. So are those your two examples of if it's a crutch, it's bad, a crutch, it's bad. If it helps improve your self-esteem, it's good. No, that's, I was just like, I mean, there's, it really, I mean, that's like a situation dependent thing. I'd say it's not, uh, it's not a black and white issue. I think it depends on the cause. This is just me being me. This is just my opinion and my philosophy and thinking out loud. But I see most cosmetic products being negative more than positive. Yes, it, there's a lipstick effect, which I'll mention later. Yes, you can attract more mates. Yes, you might feel more confident. But to me, with marketing, it's whether it's straight up saying or subconsciously saying, hey, you're not perfect, you're not beautiful, you have imperfections. But if you buy our products, you can hide your hideous mistakes on your face or yourself thinking you're not good enough. You need to look pretty or beautiful or clean shaven or something, something. I think you're just not you're making people less comfortable in their own skin. I think you're making people more vain because they're thinking constantly how they look rather than, oh, you know what? Woke up this morning. I feel good. Rather than rather think like, oh, my eyes look so baggy. I got to do this. Oh, I got my beard isn't growing shape. I got to trim this, this, and this, and this. I mean, everyone wants to look good, but I think cosmetic pro- products are more negative than positive. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely see where you're coming from. And yeah, like I like I said previously... Yeah, when you over rely on it, you know, you over overuse it. Yeah, I can see how that'd be bad. But also you might have something important coming up and then you get, you know, whatever, like acne, pimple, blemish, whatever the fuck it is. If you're a girl, you can just go and take care of that and or someone knows how to use makeup, I guess. I don't know. Shouldn't we get comfortable in our own skin? Shouldn't we show everyone that we're human? We're all imperfected a little bit and make each other relate to each other a little bit more like the reason why i'm kind of strong on this is kids are wearing makeup younger and younger and again i saw multiple articles saying that makeup isn't bad or harmful for children i i saw no scientific evidence most of those actually came from the sites that are selling kid cosmetics and straight off the bat i disagree with them i think we should teach children how to be comfortable in their own skin and how not to be like everyone else and that everyone has their own flaws and it's okay I mean, there's a study in 2019 uh, that was looking on how much uh, the, between men and females, I think it was 17 or 18 and under, spent their average days. And girls, on average in the United States, spent an hour and three minutes on hygiene and appearance, while boys spent 40 minutes. That seems that's not a, right. 40 minutes? That's way too long. Uh, that's what I thought. I don't know. I couldn't find exactly how they were testing that but yeah i uh, i mean maybe they're all taking like 15 minute long showers there's 30 minutes right there one in the morning one at night i i i'll i'll be honest with you nick i wake up go for a run shower brush my teeth put on my contacts comb my hair and off the off the out the door i go from the time my alarm goes off to i'm in my work truck is 20 minutes so and then shower at the end of the day so probably i I could say 10, 20 minutes a day, I guess is your, is, is probably your minimum. If you got yeah, like maybe, one well, shower, maybe brushing your new teeth, age. deodorant. Uh, yeah, that seems like a lot. Yeah. I don't know, but no, I, I agree with your point. You're yeah. So getting back to the, your original point, I definitely think that there's like, a, I guess how young is too young is, is the question. And I'm not a parent, so I really don't. Don't know, but it's because it's one of those things where at some point you ha- you do have to learn, I guess. Now, 
I think you're going to argue for a completely makeup free society, and I don't, I, I don't think that's feasible. No, I actually don't want to argue that point. I, are, I just want to make my argument is less is sometimes more. Because I'll be honest, Nick. Sometimes you see the people who look like clowns because they put so much makeup on, or refuse to go out in public even to grab a cup of coffee if they don't have their makeup on. That to me is a bit extreme. If you want to go out on a nice date night, you want to, you know, go clubbing, you want to go dancing, you want to, I don't know, go see an orchestra, I can understand putting on makeup. Sure, you want to look your best, you want to impress. But, like, go grab a coffee with an old friend or douse yourself so much with cologne, face, aftershave, uh, makeup, lipstick, eyeshadow, all that so much that it just looks unhuman. It's too much. Again, I my my battle is less is more, and I think we need to reassess on the importance of makeup in individual and society lives. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I don't know. I don't really know the current state of makeup, but I feel like using less of everything is like the style right now. Don't know if that extends to makeup or not, or I could just be stuck in the Pacific Northwest. Who knows? Well, makeup definitely has its point. I mean, it's a... Uh... It's point in society. I mean, just in alone, I saw a very interesting, I guess, self-help article about makeup when I was researching this. And her point was it was helping identify groups to help identify your friends. So find your tribe. Are they goth? Are they prep? Are they natty? Are they like stuff like that, which I thought was kind of interesting for the younger age perspective of wearing cosmetics, of trying to find your people. Like, if everyone looks the same, eh, it's kind of hard to tell who's who. If everyone's allowed to dress themselves up and wear whatever makeup they want, it makes it a lot easier to identify your crowd, so to speak. And don't get me wrong, makeup really does help people psychology, really does help people psychologically wise on being more confident. Nick, are you familiar with the lipstick effect? I, I don't know. So the lipstick effect is a psychological occurrence. That happens pretty much when a woman wears makeup. She simply feels more confident and therefore, and also feels more attractive and therefore is more attractive. And I found a lot of in- contradicting information between makeup and self esteem. So, like, I, I liked how you said it's not, it should, makeup shouldn't be a crutch. It could, it should simply be the cherry on top, so to speak, for lack of better words. But I saw, Harvard with the University of Chechi found that lipstick was still in great effect and had great results. And they did a test group, a test group of undergrad females. Now, granted, the sample size was only like 186, 187, something like that. But all of those girls had the lipstick effect and in co- confidence. They tested what they like, how they interacted with certain scenarios without makeup, and then some with makeup. Uh, in this case, it was lipstick being the makeup. And the lipstick effect is still in effect. And I just thought that was really interesting on how that makes people feel more confident. I guess, what's the saying, Nick? Uh, If you want to see someone who they truly are, give them a mask and they will show you who they truly are. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that sounds right. Damn, that's a better opener than the other one we had. Dang, we're coming out with all the openers late in the podcast. Well, this is always how this is how it always works. Or right when we finish. True, true. Yeah, no, I I agree, with, I I agree with your point of that's uh it, that used certain way of makeup can definitely be detrimental, but I think that goes back to just like everything else we talked about, any tool used incorrectly can hurt can harm you, and so I guess the question is how do you promote you know <laughs> that sounds wrong I was gonna say like safe makeup ownership <laughs> like safe gun ownership, but that's not. Uh, I guess it'd be like positive. I don't know. Like, how do how do you promote body positivity? Yes, without, without being an ass about yes. doing it. Good question. I don't think anyone's figured out the answer for that yet. But another issue is this makeup isn't just affecting animals. It's not just affecting the individuals. It's affecting entire countries, and it's not even affecting the people who are wearing it. It's, it's affecting other people. The makeup industry is is dirty. Is in pollution. Like, I don't know if you want to stick on this. Is that what you're... I was gonna, I was gonna talk about child labor. Oh yeah, we can do that. 
Well, I was going to talk about Mica for a little bit. M A. No, sorry, M I C A. Like the Rock. It's a. Uh, yeah. It's huge in the cosmetic world. Mica is a huge industry, and actually, the market is growing for the because it's in such high demand. Most of it comes from India. Tends to be mined by children in unsafe mine, child labor, and causes the death of children because the mines are unsafe and breathing all those chemicals. And it's all the you know that sh- you know that shine makeup gives to some people. That's that's mica. The mica is what gives people like the shininess. And because of that, kids are dying. I was watching a documentary on this, and this uh, poor village in India. Uh, high in mica but that was the only product they have so they got kind of corrupted this girl eight years old has to go down in these mines pick up mica bring them back in one basket and when interviewed she goes i'm scared but this is the only way i can put food on the table for my family i don't like going down the deep dark caves one kids eight years old shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table for their family two forcing a kid to go into unsafe minds simply to make other people's skin seem shiny that they're going to wash off at the end of the night i am disgusted that is horrible and wretched yeah and uh i guess uh, what i guess the theme these last however many episodes is just we need to stop buying stuff from third world countries yes yeah we've been on a roll nick of uh sad depressing topics and Boy, animal testing, China, chemi- engineers, chemicals, glitter, uh, invading the, uh, the planet, and boy, child labor. We're hitting on all cylinders today, aren't we? All the good stuff. We, have, we haven't made it to environmental degradation yet, so we're still rolling. Well, I was just surprised you haven't heard about the mica, because it was everywhere when I was researching this. On, It seems like it's getting some traction and people wanted to stop, but people really like looking shiny, I guess. That's uh, I was trying to think of some like future robot joke, but it's not there. Let's keep, let's move on. <laughs> um, no, I, I, uh, I think we researched pretty different things. Well, before we get into the environmental, so like, and that research thing, I want to say it's because it's happening in Asia and in India, and it's also kind of disgusting. Is not the right word, but it's unappe, not unappealing. It's um. What's it called when it ruins your appetite? Uh, There's a word for it. It spoils your appetite. It's unappetizing. I don't know. Sour. I don't know. Yeah, it leaves a sour taste in my mouth. Um, are you familiar with a thing that's happening in the world called skin lightening? And this is not a South Park thing. Correct. Then no. Apparently, apparently, a bunch of different cultures for a long time now, lighter skin has always been more favorable in their cultures. And now with modern chemicals and technology, people are doing it. People are getting injections and creams to chemically lighten their skin. The market for skin lighteners is an $8.6 billion market. Uh, Granted, like I said, this is happening a lot in the Asian region and African region because, well, you can't get any wider than me. I mean, if you put a, a Twinkie next to me, I'm pretty sure I'm wider than the Twinkie. But talk about being wanting to be comfortable in your own skin. People should not have to wanting to whiten their skin up with injections and creams to change their pigment color. That is, and it's so much so that so many companies are feeding into it, where it's an $8.6 billion industry. Some, that, again, that's just a sour taste in my mouth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it just seems like, no matter what you purchase, you can't have any product that's not made with child or forced labor and these days. It, it's what it seems like. You got to make everything yourself. I guess all those. I guess all those South Park episodes are coming to fruition. They're becoming the true true. Yeah, I don't know. I've never heard of skin skin lightning. Yes, I mean I feel like I've probably seen it. Like it seems familiar, but I've never actually like large scale heard about it. And the effect like that just seems completely something that would happen though like i'm not even like i never never debate you on that like that's like oh yeah that's definitely happening right now i mean how many people put uh silicone injections into their bodies how many people 
still harvest endangered species for uh, tribal medicine and creams to just make your skin lighter to i don't know to be like someone else that i i if nikki you were telling me that i would have kept on walking i wouldn't have skipped a beat oh yeah exactly but you're about to get us into the environmental until i brought up that disturbing fact of people lightening their skins because they don't feel comfortable in their own skin sorry nick how about you bring us in the happy light of the impact that cosmetics is having on the environment well i mean i'm not going to list everything but it's a long list it's it's uh it's not good just like any third world you know when things are manufactured in third world it's not the best and it's mostly it's not that they're manufactured there a lot of times they're manufactured in another country but the products are contained obtained from some poor uh poorly regulated environment and it can lead people to do you know like we talked about some other time i'm really drawing a blank but oh and the coral reefs all the like getting people come and taking like a specific animal even if it's endangered stuff like that uh i don't i'm looked mostly at perfumes mike but a lot of the trying to like the bases the stuff that makes the smell last is really just like a lot of animal products that doesn't surprise me because if I'll be honest. The only thing I am familiar with for fragrances and cosmetics are what the ancients used and just like the disgusting things that they put in there, like goat urine and stuff like that. So I imagine much hasn't changed. Yeah. I mean, and then a lot of a lot of perfume is is just like alcohol too. So that's oh yeah, to to extract the oil from like uh like zest and and different fruits and flowers. I imagine. Yeah. Um. Which isn't like. I mean, you can make that anywhere, but there's a lot of weird, just like, it's not all of them, but it seems to me kind of like going back to Coral Reefs, like the really good, like targeting the fish for medicinal qualities. It kind of seems like that. Like, like, um, have you heard of Ambergist, Mike? That sounds very okay. really familiar. Is that the yes. gall, wait, amber... the gallbladder for oh, bears? Oh, no. Um, Gallbladder for no, fish. it's not a gallbladder, but it's a, it's basically, and I've read a couple different things of what it is, but what I think is the most reasonable is these uh, whales eat a bunch of giant squid, and the beaks don't decompose because they're tough, and they sit in their stomach, and then sometimes they'll puke them out, but occasionally they won't, and so they'll like form this giant glob of like squid beaks that gets kind of hardened with other stuff in their uh, body and either gets pooped out or gets so big that nothing else can go past it and the whale ends up dying but it's like crazy expensive and the only way you can't create it uh what's it called you can't create it you know synthetically synthetically just because it takes so long to uh, to do, like you know, we're, you're talking like years, like over, like it depends on the size of the amber gist. but it's some are, you know, only like half a pound. I think the largest was like twenty something or forty pounds or something. Uh, so, but it's super valuable for perfumes. So. It's uh like Is it like a binder? Is it have a certain scent? Well smell? it actually like it itself smells like shit. Okay. <laughs> okay, good to know. Um yeah, people have described it as smelling everything from like human poop to dog poop to throw up. Um some people think it smells All good. Right, so two qu- so two questions. One, why is it used in makeup? And two, who's a sick son of a bitch who thought that they should put it in makeup? Uh well, it it wasn't this person's idea to put it in makeup, but King Charles II did eat it a lot as one of his favorite foods. So I'm gonna have to go with the English. Just kidding. Uh, I am disgusted at the moment of just just thinking of eating used squid beak sh- it, shit whale. Uh, I don't even know how to describe it properly whale shit 
squid beak i i don't think there's enough money in the world for you to pay me to eat that but like uh it like if you look like it's super expensive so if you find it like sometimes people walking the beach find it sometimes people you know uh fishermen find it floating um like w- someone found a pound of it in england and it was sixty three thousand dollars and people like have found way bigger ones than that I, i'm at a little loss for so what do they even, why do they put it in makeup it it helps so you can do stuff to it to make it smell good um and uh so like once it once you i don't know make it smell good it's the smell lasts a long time um so it goes from smelling like gross ocean poop and then it can become nice i just looked up a picture of what it looks like and yeah ocean poop is exactly the word choice out of you to describe it i don't know but it like it's it's you know any seafaring country like the egyptians used it and the chinese use it so i think it's one of those things that's like it's so old that it's just it's uh it's been established i don't know so is stoning people to death oh well, i shouldn't say that there are countries that still do that to people but doesn't mean it's the right thing to do i uh, yeah i don't i don't know it's it's very i don't exactly know all about it i just know it's super prized for the perfume industry uh well i'm a little off guard with that i did not know whale beak poop would be worth so much money and you also just had me have like flashbacks do you remember when malls used to be a thing and they would have that perfume store with that would just make your eyes water with the with the amount of scents uh yeah i like how you open that with do you remember when malls used to be a thing (laughs) are are malls still a thing Uh, we have a mall in town (laughs) is it open i like half the stores are oh okay that's better than i thought yeah but one how can anyone smell any scent in that store they just not go from us but two i wonder how much money your whale poop was in those bottles like i wonder what's the ratio of whale poop beak beak whale poop beak whale poop uh is in a perfume bottle like is it a gram is it is it an ounce how much is actually in makeup i'm wondering i'm wondering just the ratio i'm just trying to think and also i'm just i'm having horrible memories now of that disgusting scent stores where you can't you can't breathe because it's so overpowerful yeah i don't know i think uh i'd have to like i imagine the this like amber gist is being put into like a bottle perfume that's going to sell for you know like three thousand dollars so i don't think it's it's a widely used i think it's a very high end high brand yeah. gotcha and it's it because of that reason it maybe it's a larger portion but you're paying more for it but some of the lesser known like that's probably the most famous but oh just a lot of scent glands from different animals are taken to for to for the manufacturer perfumes and you know in more developed countries it's usually some kind of farm operation but a lot of times it's not that Ooh, poaching my favorite yep we're hitting all the fun stuff today god damn poaching so disgusting i don't i mean i get it if people are trying to feed their family i don't condone it but i get it but man (sighs) nick we just went from hitting on all four cylinders with all the disgusting things we're talking about to a full-on v8 yeah well and i guess in the you know it's like don't i don't know we're uh, you we're the ones ultimately consuming the product right well i guess in this case it's asia's doing a lot of the consumption but everyone's consuming this product so it's hard to be like you bastards yeah i mean but there are a lot of different i'm surprised we've not moved to more synthetic smells one for ethic reasons and two for scientific reasons i don't know if this is a tall tale i didn't research it you just reminded me with the with the beak whale poop of I, again, this might be a wife's sales days of the grain salt of d- depending on a person's sexual cycle, they're attracted to more different scents than others. So I don't know. There's the t- wife's tale of where you're the girl you're going after is father's deodorant and she'll be more attractive to you. 
There's one uh, for females of having your nether region scent on your neck so it heightens for men to make you more attracted to you because they get that scent that smell and want to breed with you more and vice versa uh, men apparently can do the same if depending on the woman's cycle with sweat i'm just wondering why we haven't moved to more synthetic brands and smells to actually heightened perfume fragrancy and attractiveness again all those things i just mentioned could be wives sales I remember hearing about them. Not quite sure if, if where that information comes from. I imagine it's just that it's so cheap right now to to produce the way we're producing that the initial cost of of doing it synthetically just doesn't make financial sense. If I had to guess, I'm sure there's a market for it, a small market, but because but I think that the problem you're running into is the people who are really like gung-ho, going to save more money for the environment, blah, blah, blah. They're just going to not purchase those products, right? True. And I imagine the big names in makeup and cosmetic industry that already dictate and control the majority of the markets uh, aren't going to mess with the winning formula. No pun intended. Wait, say it again. That the no pun intended part, like, you know, formula, cosmetics. Okay. The, the Sorry, I didn't the, quite understand. So the, you're... I'm saying the companies that are the large companies, the number one companies of all across the world making cosmetics, aren't going to switch up what they're making money for. Like you said, not mess with their profit regions. If they already have something and already can dictate what's fashionable and what's not fashionable, why would they move to synthetic if it's going to cost them more money? Yeah. Yep, exactly. That's what I was thinking. And then the other thing, too, is like those, this is, I don't even know if I should ask this. This might be super obvious. Like, are they coming out with new ones all the time, or is it the same one? Like, I know, like, Chanel Number no. 5 is a very popular, is the most popular scent in the world. So, like, can you, can you change to synthetic and get the same result? Because that's, like, an established scent. I imagine we can synthetically make the scent. Don't know the upfront cost. Don't know the cost into making sense. Don't know, honestly, how the fat, the trending market and cosmetic world works i don't know if things have a season i don't know if it's just like if things just go through waves and comes back i don't know if some scents and smells are classics or new or i i i'll be honest i'm a, i'm a bit lost like when i go to buy soap and deodorant does it say deodorant cool does it say soap cool that's about my extent of research when i buy beauty products does it say toothpaste cool yeah no i completely agree boy we are the wrong people talk about this well when like when i first moved away from moved out of my parents house and i was doing shopping i was like oh what kind of shampoo do i get and he's like this looks like the stuff we have at my house this must be it (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah I, hey, there's that brand loyalty again of, hey, I'm familiar with this. I'm going to stick with this. Yep, pretty much. I've ve- I've ventured out in my now, but before I was just kind of like, oh, shit. <laughs> why, do, why, do, why do I feel like you have a, a collection of tree colognes, like your musky cedar scents? I have three colognes, and they've all been given to me or as like some sort of joke. Or no, my my wife got me one when we were in high school. None are tree-based. I bought one uh, at the Pendleton Roundup as a joke. And then when I broke my nose, my coworker got me uh, like a bunch of stuff that had smells in it, like like cologne and then like smelling salts and shit like that. So those are, that's the only time I've ever uh, had two of those are unopened. So it's uh not the right person to be talking to. Yeah, I I much prefer to be covered in sawdust and uh oil. That's usually my scent. Oh god, I love the s- smell of fresh cut wood, especially when you're the one doing it. Uh but you mentioned synthetics and I was wondering if I could deviate into that a little bit. Yep. So, Nick, we go f- I try to bring trees into the t- conversation, but I'm going to take it the opposite. I teased you, now I'm going the opposite direction with nanotech 
nanotech is entering the cosmetic world in hair products, uh, sunscreens, like uh, on different levels. So for hair products, they're using nanotech to bring the ingredients deeper into the scalp and the hair follicles to make it more effective. Sunscreens to make it more penetrate your skin so it's it's more transparent but still is protective. So it, there's a lot of money going into research for new co- uh, cosmetics. And there's a lot of money in old cosmetics and there's a lot of money in current cosmetics. It seems like investing in cosmetics isn't the worst idea there, Nick. No. Well, it's one of those industries that's been around for a while it's always going to be around it's just a matter of is that company going to be around i guess besides if you if we're going to give any uh stock advice mike or investing advice it's going to be look at whatever uh people in congress are investing in but that's all i really have for nanotech uh i'm not sure if you had any more with fragrance because i honestly did not really look up i said fragrance really weird i i didn't really look up into perfumes and colognes i didn't really look into scents yeah i just kind of was like hmm this is interesting so that's that's kind of all i really had onto it i might have a little few things down the road that tie in with what we're talking about but let's keep on uh moving well as always nick we tend to bite off more than we can chew with sometimes the simplest ideas cosmetics fashion music tend to be the most complicated ones and I came up with a hypothesis that I want to run by you when researching this. I think makeup is both depending on age group, career, location, and I I want to uh, deviate this. So location, India with people using whitening, skin whitening products uh, based on their pigmentation. They tend to be... uh, darker than european based so they want to lighten up their skin maybe for their culture reasons maybe for world reasons i'm i actually don't know the reasons so that's their location i think career is also a big point i mean if you look at a woman going to a party in college she will probably dress very differently than a businesswoman going into a meeting uh i i think on locate uh, that goes with career and location of do i want to help attract a mate because makeup does help attract mate. You mean you look more beautiful, both for men and females. You look good. You feel good. That aura comes off. And I also imagine that if your peer group, your group that you hang out with all has a certain trend, you tend to follow it. Like you, Nick, you had a certain soap in your household and you just went, eh, I'll stick with it. I imagine that's the same. And uh, to, to, at like athletes at, at like career based so athletes might have to wear more sweat proof clothing like surfers have to wear some sunscreen uh track people have to wear certain deodorant compared to an office worker who might not uh, the makeup matters less on how it handles the heat or something like that and sticking with career also do you need makeup so uh, that's my hypothesis that Makeup is depending on age group, career, and location. And I think people go through different fads of makeup throughout their entire life based on those three attributes. Yeah. Well, and then uh, I guess this is something that I kind of looked at. So I did, I, I tried, I was like, okay, so as a dude who doesn't wear cologne or perfume, why do people wear perfume? Like generally. And uh, so I looked at, I'm not going to name the study because it really didn't help me out, but pretty much it just said like every reason, like every single person they asked had like a different reason from this is the smell that I was wearing when like I met my husband to I just think it smells good and this allows me to do certain things. And so like my wife, she wears like if we go out to like a nice dinner or something, she wears uh, like the same perfume that she wore like in high school when we'd go on a date because it like reminds her of when we were kids which is super sad to say because i'm old now but uh well scent is one of the most powerful organs and it's very tied into our memory so that makes sense to me yeah and so it's it's just hard to pin you know i think a lot of it yes does boil down to like it makes you more confident but there's just so many different reasons why people wear 
and I, I the study I was looking at was just perfume, but I'm ass- I'm assuming this applies to all that transfers over. Yeah. probably. Well, I don't. I feel like there's a more streamlined meaning than all those different meanings. Maybe people are just saying those opinions doesn't mean it's true. I maybe there's some more subconscious things going on, which I have no idea about. But for all my fellow brethren men out there, less is more for cologne. Can't tell you this enough. How many times I've walked by someone in the hallway and my eyes go, oof, that's way too much cologne. Less is fucking more. Sorry, just wanted to point that out. Also would have been a good opener. <laughs> God damn it, Nick. We, uh, we're a day late, dollar short, as usual. But that's about all I have for cosmetics. Like I said, it's a broad category. I'm not quite sure if you have anything else. No, I was just about to ask if you had anything else. No, I don't I don't really have anything. Again, this, cosmetics is something so old in our family's traditions, our ancestors' traditions. It's just been in humanity for so long that it's right in front of our noses, or on our noses, and we don't quite see it. It's... It's so in-depth into our different cultures, and there's so much to dive into. And like we said, we are fools with a capital F, and we are not in tune with this world. This world does not really affect us on a daily, weekly, or ever basis, really. So we've obviously missed something, or we've misinformed some way, or maybe you want to explain your reason why you wear certain makeup products or makeup. And if so... You can hit us up on our social media, and where can they find us, Nick? You can find us on Instagram and Reddit, and we're slowly backfilling the Reddit page with all our previous episodes, so if you have something to say to the previous episodes, you can search for it there and then comment on it. And can you find us on Twitter? You cannot find us on Twitter. Because no matter how much lipstick you put on that pig, it's still a pig. Oh, that was a good one. Well, before we get out of here, Mike, Thank you. what are you reading? I am still reading The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. It is the book that I have to take a little bit at a time. It is quite, it makes you think quite a bit. So I'll be reading this one for quite a while. What about you, Nick? What are you reading right now? I am still reading uh, The Savage Wars of Peace, Small Wars and the Rise of American Power by Max Boot. And with that being said, as always, thank you all for listening. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram 